Some of you that are used to me, this is easy, but for some of you that are not, it might get confusing. All of you that are mothers, please stay seated. All of you that are not mothers, please stand and give the mothers a standing ovation for what they mean to you. Way to go, moms. Thank you, moms. Mother's Day, very special time, of course, in a, our American culture. And uh, uh, we're going to talk about an example of a mom. I usually, in a baby dedication setting, I'll give a Reader's Digest version over a young lady uh, by the name of Hannah. So why don't you go to 1 Samuel, and that's where we'll be for our text today, of course, is Mother's Day. But we have also added... Um, our baby dedication Sunday to today. Oftentimes, I'll do it on, do it on uh, Father's Day, but we decided this year when we were putting the calendar together last fall that we would do it on Mother's Day, which we have done a number of times in the past. And uh, Mother's Day is, a, again, a special time. I've heard different messages over the years, uh, and, and I don't know, some of you might be note takers, and you go back and say, ah, I heard that message or saw a message. And this text, I'm sure, is been preached or taught to you at one time or another if you've gone to church on a regular basis. And uh, oftentimes um, we speak about someone like Hannah. I have not spoken in thoroughness over this passage uh, again in a Mother's Day, so uh, it'll, be a, it'll be an enjoyable time. There's a lot of good practical teachings here, and as we look at it on, again, Mother's Day and also Baby Dedication Sunday, we have 12 children being dedicated unto the Lord. Uh, looking forward so much to that at the end of service. That means you get a, um, a treat. I will preach a lot shorter today so that we have time to have. <laughs> <laughs> Who was that? I'm coming off this stage right now. Was that you? Who was that? Bobby, find him. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I know who it was. That's why I was trying to keep the attention. <laughs> Obviously, we know the one that likes the attention in the family. Ugh. I know who it was. Ah, uh, she's sitting right in front of me. Mother's Day, a special time. Very special time. Uh, I would be remiss if I didn't realize that maybe it's all so difficult as much as it's a very special time, but maybe memories of your mother, maybe memories of childhood are difficult. Maybe it's not a happy Mother's Day, but, uh, you know, for some, maybe um, mom may not have been the mother that you wanted. For others, maybe you've had a mom that's been gone for a lot of years, so Mother's Day uh, or her birthday or things like that get hard. My mom's been gone almost 36 years, so... 
Hey, Mom, how's things? You'd like to be able to have a conversation. Maybe for some uh, mother-daughter relationship or mother-son relationship has waned over the years and, and there's distance. But maybe today, uh, through our time around the Word, that we will look at this woman named Hannah and say, wow, she really... Uh, she so, shows so many pieces and parts. We don't ever capture, hey, this is the way that she raised her children since we know that she gave her child Samuel. She lent him to the Lord after she weaned him. That little baby grew in her tummy after nine months. She weaned. And uh, back in that time, maybe three years for sure, maybe four, the weaning process in the Hebrew culture. And then she brought that beautiful baby that God gave her unto Eli the priest. And we know Samuel, who he became oftentimes, and it'll be said maybe a couple times during the message, God used a baby more than once to change the trajectory of a people that was messed up. And then he used a baby to change the whole world when God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And he... Jesus Christ, divinity, son of God, son of man, was in the womb of a woman. It's a powerful, powerful thought. And old Mary, his mother, gave birth to him like any other child, but he wasn't any other child. And so this morning I want you to think of this example of Hannah. And maybe as a mom, a dad, a parent, a, a grandparent, maybe as just a spiritual leader in in young boys and girls' lives. Maybe today you'll see that, hey, you could be a difference maker as a parent. That's what we entitled our message, Difference Maker. And I know that I use that terminology a little bit here and there to, to describe a person or talk to a person or give some exhortation or lift. Hey, you are a difference maker. And today we're going to see how Hannah and her uh, accounting in Scripture and we're not even going to get into chapter 2 or chapter 3 and, and see what kind of woman this is, especially the first 10 verses of chapter 2 that show you what kind of woman she was as a, man, a woman of prayer. I remember Bobby preaching a message 11 years ago. I have notes on it on, on speaking of all in or are you all in, and he used Hannah in that text and talked about Hannah and her worship. And her. Can you imagine you preaching on worship? That's a shock to me. But... But yeah, that she had an acceptable sacrifice and that God used her. I, I remember uh, 25 years ago on a Mother's Day, I had notes on uh, the former pastor, Rick Johnson, preaching a Mother's Day message and talked about Hannah, that she was a woman of great passion, of great prayer, and she was also a woman of great perception. I, I heard George Grace use this passage of Scripture, 25, uh, 1994. Gosh, that's a long time ago, 30 years ago to preach a message I had notes of, and he used the life of Hannah to preach about faith promise giving. How that God, and this is just a, a note from, and I'm hoping that I at least wrote it down accurately enough, God, give to me something I don't have so I can give it back to your work. That's faith promise. God, I don't have anything to give, but whatever I have, I'm going to give to you. God, give me something to give to you. And so this text is really a tremendous text, and we're going to walk through it. A difference maker. Let me just simply read off a little bit of a definition up on the screen. A difference maker is an ordinary person who accomplishes extraordinary things by creating positive change in his or her community and the lives of others. Difference makers do not have to be famous. Different ma difference makers can be parents, coaches, or good friends. In fact, qualities that can make someone a difference maker include determination, I like that one, leadership, I like that one, teamwork, inspiration, courage, excellent. Think of mothers that are truly difference makers, people that have been a difference maker in your life. They show integrity, generosity, compassion, and on and on. Mothers, they truly have a lot of great qualities, and each one of us would say, hey, these are the things that I would love to be if I, as a mother, were to do it well. I want to be a difference maker like Hannah. Maybe you're thinking of your mother and thinking, wow, I wish my mom was stronger in this area, or my mom was, uh, did more of that in my life. Well, I just thought of three. I, I got, actually had a long, long list, but I put down four of them, just really just a quick comment to kind of set this up. Needed. 
Mothers are needed. From the moment of conception until the child's last breath, it is evident that mother is needed. Mother's needed. Needed so very much. And if the mother is absent or the mother doesn't fulfill that which is needed, then it can be tough. In the home and childhood, you remove the mother and you realize the incredible huge gap there is in the family. Wanted. A mother's also wanted. You say, well, that's just, no, it's different. And you'll know what I mean. From a very young age, children make it clear that in the home, their mother is wanted. Now, this is more for boys. Mommy! Mama! Mama! What do you want? What do you want? I'm right here. What do you want? I don't want anything. I just want you. That's boys with their mothers. Girls, on the other hand, anyway. <laughs> and then they have children, so let's go to the next one. Sacrificial. From the day of nursing to the day of a child, excuse me, a child becomes a parent, he or she knows mother is sacrificial. At the moment that you become a parent, you realize how much sacrifice your mother has put forth for you. You go have a baby, get married, have a child, and you find out how maybe you were a little cranky with your mother. Maybe you didn't say, I love you as much. Oh, my mother, she sacrificed her life. I know that. I didn't know at first. My mother divorced her husband after 31 years in 1984. She was dead four years later. And we learned later on with all the bickering in our family, my mother sacrificed. And when I became a parent, I realized she lived her life. She was born in 1932. The other day would have been her 92nd birthday. She lived her life in sacrifice. I don't know if my mother ever truly followed after the things that maybe God had meant for her. The sweetest thing was I had a chance to see her, witness her, sit by her side while she called out to Jesus to save her 16 months before she died. You see, mother's sacrifice, they're needed, they're wanted, and lastly, of my little short list, love. From the time that God creates that baby, there is a special bond known as a mother's love. There are times where mothers carry the term and then tragedy may come. There are times where, you know, you hear of a baby being born, but the mom has such a tumultuous, awful delivery that they end up dying in delivery over the decades and centuries. I'm sure the stories are so many more than maybe we even know. And so Mother's Day can be very difficult in a lot of ways, but when we understand, or at least get a glimpse of what it's like to say, hey, God made that little life inside a woman's womb. There is a special bond that none of us that have not had a child, that have not carried a baby, can he really understand. There's a special no bond known as a mother's love. That's what makes, to me, this setting of Hannah. Hannah was a difference maker. And a lot of things that, again, we could see here, we could preach this chapter for about four or five weeks, but I really want to just do like a 25, 30 minute walk through of it and, and, and just let God talk to you. Just, would you just let God speak to you? And would, as I said the last few weeks and have been saying off and on for a lot of years, don't just say, ah, oh, teach me something, pastor, or God, you got to teach me something. But today, maybe you would just stop for the next 30 minutes and say, Lord God Almighty, there's something I need to learn today. I don't know what it is. I'm not a mom, I don't know if I'll ever be a mom, or I am a mom, I've gone through a rough life, or you're sitting sweet and you're a mom, a grandma, and you're loving life, whatever it may be, you just might be in a place where you're going, we're going into the Word of God, God, I need to learn from you, I want to learn one thing. First Samuel, chapter number one, the way we're going to approach it is just very simply, we're going to read a few verses. A lot of times I read the whole passage ahead of time. I'm going to read a few verses and make a comment on each one of these little sections, four small sections of Scripture to get us through 28 sweet verses. Chapter 1, 
verse number one, the first book of Samuel. Now there was a certain man, Ramah Thaim Zophim, of Mount Ephraim, and his name was Elkanah, the son of Jeroham, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of, now those sound pretty cool, you know, they, they end with a U, they end with an O, and then you hit the son of Zuf. I don't know. That'd be tough. What's your dad and mom's name? Mr. and Mrs. Zuff. Hmm, okay, that's okay. And of course it says there, he's an Ephrathite. And he had two wives. The name of the one was Hannah, the other, the name of the other, Peninnah. And Peninnah had children, but Hannah had no children. And this man went up out of his city yearly to worship and to sacrifice unto the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, the priests of the Lord were there. It's interesting that in our Bible, it's just kind of stuck in there, but they'll come into play a little bit later, as we know. Eli, of course, is the high priest. Verse 4, And when the time that Elkanah offered, he gave to Peninnah, his wife, and to all his sons and daughters portions. But unto Hannah he gave a worthy portion, for he loved Hannah, but the Lord had shut up her womb. Keep in mind, going to the high holiday, they bring the sacrifice. The portion is according to how many children you have. So he gives, of course, to Peninnah, who has children. But it does say in the scripture there that he gave a worthy portion to Hannah. Interesting. We'll get into that a little bit here in a moment. Verse number six, and her adversary. Now, Peninnah's name is, of course, recorded. It means a jewel's name, a pearl. Okay, so that, that's her name, and that's the meaning of it. Hannah's name, of course, uh, means God's grace or God's favor. And so that's really powerful. And Can Elkanah, his name means God has created. So those two, wow, together, Hannah, Elkanah. But Peninnah, we'll, we'll give her her due. But what we've got here is an adversary and what does she do? She provoked her sore, which means she rode her. That's my translation. For to make her fret, ooh, because the Lord has shut up her womb. And as he did so year by year when she went up to the house of the Lord, so she provoked her. Therefore she wept and did not eat. It gets a little bit more profound when you go up to worship in that high holiday and there's the portion given. After, of course, the sacrifice is made, given to the priest. Now the, the family has remaining off of what they've given to be able to have a meal. This is a celebration meal of the high holiday. But of course, Hannah's being provoked by Peninnah. It says she wept and did not eat. Has anybody brought you to a place where they provoked you, bothered you, hurt you, antagonized you, bullied you to where you wept so much and then you couldn't eat? Think of the setting of this woman where, who's at the temple, who's at worship for the high holiday. Then said Elkanah her husband, excuse me, then said Elkanah her husband to her, Hannah, now, real quick before I read this, this is classic guy stuff. Now, let's just set it up. All you husbands out there, let's just kind of, you know, aren't I enough? Why are you crying? <laughs> Hannah, why weepest thou? And why eatest thou not? Why is thy heart grieved? Am not I better to thee than ten sons? You husbands have probably said something like that to your wives, haven't you? Why are you whining and crying? I mean, all we got's a tent in the backyard. <laughs> We're doing pretty good, right? You're married to me. Good deal. Right, Cheryl? Not really. Okay, so <laughs> now let's take the spiritual side of things. He really is a good spiritual leader here. Why don't you be thankful for what you have? We're here at worship unto the Lord. We're here at the temple. And the thing is, he checks in on her, and he's checking her, but she's already checked because this is a woman 
who's filled with worship for the Lord. So, my first thought, real simple, as to this woman being a difference maker and this man. Samuel's parents, I looked at them first, together. They're dedicated and divided. What do you mean? Well, Elkanah and Hannah were good and godly people in a home of worship that was also filled with contention. Whew. Now, in Scripture we read in the Old Testament law, and you can look up Deuteronomy and back all the way to Genesis, even Abraham, he married another woman to have a child. It wasn't the first time. And God always desired in his original plan that one man marries one woman and that's the way it ought to be. But here we have a setting where we know in the Old Testament, bigamy and divorce really were not prohibited by Jewish law when you look up scripture, but that doesn't mean, oh, okay, obviously I can just go ahead and do whatever I feel like doing. No, no, that's what the scripture is saying. You see, him, Elkanah, marrying another woman, maybe it is to have the children. So what do I see here in this difference maker in this mother situation? When women who are mothers decide to be dedicated to the call of motherhood, they can handle all things, no matter how divided things get at home. It ought to be for parents. There are things that you're probably going to be divisive about, you're divided about. There's things that aren't quite right. When you have a godly woman who is a difference maker, who is dedicated, and Alcana is dedicated to worship of the Lord, what can you resolve? Every single difficulty. You say you can't. Yes, you can resolve every single difficulty. But both have to be dedicated to the Lord and they both were. They also had a division because it was coming from contention because, hey, Panetta says, hey, nah, 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 nah. Bullying's rough. Contention's hard. Only by pride come in contention. But the well-advised is wisdom. We see here very simply, but Hannah in verse 5, gave, he, gave, he gave her a worthy portion, for he loved Hannah, but the Lord had shut up her womb. Nowhere does it say in this setting, other than the fact that Alcana is married to Panenna and has sons and daughters and portions and all that, but we see this phrase, for he loved Hannah. He also loved the Lord thy God. It says the Lord of hosts in verse number 3, and it also says it in verse number 11, the Lord God of hosts who is the Lord God, Jehovah Sabaoth, who is the God of the Sabbath, the God of their lives. They know who he is. They raise him up high. So this contention is there where this adversary is provoking. Elkanah, <laughs> he's a good guy. In fact, he's a good and godly guy. But he had the two wives, and it created some things. But they were dedicated together as parents to make things work out well and boy i tell you they were able to work out so much we'll see as things continue verse number nine down through verse number 18 let's read these so anna ro hannah rose up after they'd eaten in shiloh and after they had drunk now eli the priest sat upon a seat by a post of the temple of the lord because they're in shiloh right they're in the temple they're there for high holidays they're spending some time in worship spending some time in fellowship and she was in bitterness of soul and prayed unto the Lord and wept sore. She vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if thou wilt indeed look on the affliction of mine handmaid and remember me and not forget thine handmaid, but wilt give unto thine handmaid a man-child, then I will give him unto the Lord all the days of his life, and there shall no razor come upon his head the vow of a Nazarite. Wow. She is saying, I will vow to give him, if you give him to me, 
to give him back to you. And it came to pass as she continued praying before the Lord that Eli marked her mouth. We know how this story goes. You're familiar. It's a great time, if you know it, to just revisit it. Let God teach you. Of course, learn something from this. Now, Hannah, she spake in her heart. So what have we got? We've got a bitterness in soul. We have her talking to God from her heart. This is an inside thing, isn't it? It's very important. But her voice was not heard. Therefore, Eli thought she had been drunken. Eli said unto her, How long wilt thou be drunken? Put away thy wine from thee. And Hannah answered and said, No, my Lord, I am a woman of a sorrowful spirit. Heart, soul, spirit. It's all within her. It is agony that she is praying out to God. But the neat thing is she's not complaining and criticizing anything. She's going to the Lord with her bitterness and heartache. Sorrowful spirit, verse 15, I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but have poured out my soul before the Lord. Something's going on in her. She had a bitterness of soul. She's pouring out her soul into the Lord. I have a sorrowful spirit. My heart is calling to you, God. Maybe that's some of you today. It's the right thing to do. Stay there. Don't give up on the Lord. Count not thine handmaid for a daughter of Belial, for out of the abundance of my complaint and grief have I spoken here and here the two. The abundance of my <laughs> grief and complaint is that I come to you, holy God. I'm here at the temple. Eli answered and said, go in peace, because she wants to hear from the God-man the man of God who's representing God. The God of Israel grant thee thy petition thou hast asked of him. And she said, let thine handmaid find grace in thy sight. So the woman went her way and did eat, and her countenance was no more sad. Hannah's vow. This also makes her a difference maker. She was devoted and distraught. What does distress do to you? When you're distraught, what do you end up doing? Hannah called out to the Lord with conviction-filled faith. It wasn't just, well, I hope he hears me. Conviction-filled faith. And as the Bible says, and I put it in italics with quotes, in bitterness of soul and a sorrowful spirit. Mothers, when they're devoted unto the Lord, which means true worship, it's one thing to be dedicated to the purposes of God that you've called, but this is pure worship. This is devotion. If they're devoted, if you're devoted as a mother to the Lord first and always, you can walk through anything. The dry times, the hard times, moms, dads, grandparents, even if you have no children, but you work and serve and you want to see children make it in this crazy day. You think you're in a crazy day? They're off of 400 plus years of judges in a mess in the nation of Israel. And God says, I'll send a baby to fix it. At least get it off the ground. When we're surrendered to God's will, we can be difference makers. We don't make bargains. We only do submission. We don't, we don't bargain with the Lord. We just submit unto the Lord. Yes, Lord, I'm crying out. I have bitterness of soul. My spirit aches. My heart is aching. But I'm devoted to you. And in my distraughtness, in my hurt, in my pain, I realize that there's no result that you will pull off or grant to have happen that ought to determine my devotion. My devotion... Being devoted should not be predicated on the results that come at the end of it. It should be completely because you love and are loyal to the holy God of the universe. That's Hannah's vow. The third one, let's read verses down, 19 through 23. And they rose up in the morning early and worshiped before the Lord and returned and came to their house in Ramah. Consider it's they now. The parents that we talked about first off, this is a good home. These parents are together on things. After this interaction at the temple where she, her heart is broken and she's going through all that she is, her spirit, her soul, 
Husbands right along with her, they rose up, the Bible says, in morning early, worshiped before the Lord and returned. So they worshiped and then they returned and came to their house in Ramah. Elkanah knew Han Hannah, his wife, and the Lord remembered her. Woo! Right? You should be excited. Yay! She's going to have a baby. Remember when you first found out, parents? You were dancing. Wherefore, it came to pass when the time was come about after Hannah had conceived that she bare a son and called his name Samuel, because, saying, because I have asked, of him, asked him of the Lord. It's powerful. That's what the Lord has done to give him that name, Samuel. I've heard from the Lord. He's God's man. Verse number 22, but Hannah went not up, for she said unto her husband, I will not go up until the child be weaned, and then I will bring him that he may appear before the Lord and there abide forever. And Elkanah, her husband, said unto her, do what seemeth thee good, tarry until thou hast weaned him. Only the Lord establish his word. You like that one? <laughs> The Lord said he would, he heard. It says there, back in 20, that he remembered, right? He, excuse me, 2019, he remembered. Only the Lord established his word. He's going to stay true to his promises. So the woman abode and gave her son suck until she weaned him. Again, I said that. Think if she's pregnant, gives birth, nine months-ish. Weans, say, three years. It's four years since she's been to see Eli, other than maybe there's a time period. This time, in this case, it says that when Elkanah went to worship for his son that was born, mom stayed back. Samuel's birth. Two simple things about a difference maker. Dependent and destined. What do you see? How do you see that? Samuel was born into a family committed unto the Lord already. They were. And they were led by a spiritual father and a praying mother. You see, that's pretty straightforward. That is huge. Is that true of our homes today? We need more of that. If you think you can do all of this on your own and have everything go the way you hoped it would go, eh, it's going to get tough no matter what. But you ought to have the Lord on your side. Parents, you need the Lord on your side. Say, well, he'll just take care of me because he loves me. Oh, okay. Even if you straight arm the Lord, if you tell him, eh, if you say, no, I'll pray once in a while. See, Samuel was born into a family. Samuel's birth is powerful. This family was committed unto the Lord and led by a spiritual father and a praying mother. Hey, Elkanah. He's going to the house of the Lord, went up to offer unto the Lord the yearly sacrifice and his vow. There's both, they're both about vow, aren't they? You go back to verse number 11, she vowed a vow. That's a whole other message there. She made a vow. She kept it. So she's dependent upon the Lord. He's dependent upon the Lord. And they also, in this vow, both of them understand, as I bring this to bear, that mothers who have already nurtured the home in fear and in nurture, and in admonition of the Lord. That is just a simple starting point to get ready for children if they ever come. Complete dependence on God makes a difference. That's the difference maker. Complete dependence. Not once in a while, sometimes we need to be completely dependent upon him. That doesn't mean all that long list of criteria that you think then motivates God to do something for you. It's truly out of what I just said earlier, your devotion unto him in the midst of having an awful difficult time. They named him right, that old Samuel guy. And we know that we see in verse 23 that Alcanus said, hey, you know what? You have made a vow unto the Lord, you better keep it. I'll do all I can do to have you keep your vow. That's my responsibility. As a godly man, 
He is not challenging her to put him first. He's saying, okay, you vowed a vow. Well, I'm going to go unto the Lord with my vow because we make vows on a yearly basis. We make vows in our home. This is a place where we're dependent upon the Lord, and we have a destiny. This Samuel guy is destined for God's call. How many times have we gotten in the way of God's call upon some child's life? How many times has God had a plan, this incredible purpose, incredible will, holy will? God made it so in Samuel's life, but we would have never known it if mom and dad said, say, hey, we made a vow, but we're going to keep this kid because we didn't have one. You think about that, I'm sure you do. What are we doing with our children? Are we saying that we want to be difference makers as parents? I know you do. And many of you are doing it. So many of you I know being difference makers. Let's be difference makers. You say, well, I haven't been in a while. Well, then come back to making a difference. Because Samuel's birth was important, and they had a chance to do it from the very beginning because they had established something in their home. Hallelujah. If you have or you haven't, just say, okay, God, we're going to go after this thing together because I'm going to make a promise unto you, which goes to our last few verses, verse number 24, down to the rest of the chapter, and we'll pull this all together. Verse 24 says, And when she had weaned him, she took him up with her, with three bullocks and one ephah of flour and a bottle of wine, and brought him unto the house of the Lord in Shiloh. And the child was young. This is all for sacrifice, for the honor unto the Lord, for what he has done for them. There's so much to that. That is a huge passage to preach through. It's powerful what she's doing there. Verse 25, and they slew a bullock and brought the child to Eli. He's the high priest. And she said, O oh my Lord, as thy soul liveth, my Lord, I am the woman that stood by thee here praying unto the Lord. Got to be a few years, doesn't it? I'm the one. For this child I prayed. And the Lord had given me my petition which I asked of him. Therefore also I have lent him to the Lord as long as he liveth. He shall be lent to the Lord. And he worshiped the Lord there. That ought to give you like, oh gosh, something powerful there. Hannah's promise. This makes her a difference maker again in this way. She is decisive and she is determined. Hannah fulfilled her vow unto the Lord after he granted her request for Samuel, proving her foundation is the rock. Where do you get that from? Look at verse number 2 of chapter 2. There is none holy as the Lord, for there is none beside thee, neither is there any rock like I God. He, Elkanah, Hannah, the mother, they had, both had vows. Hers was more powerful, of course, from verse number 11, but he has his vow unto the Lord as well. And they both have put themselves in a place where they're saying, okay, God, we have destiny. This is what you want us to do. We are devoted unto you. And now Hannah's promise, she fulfilled her vow unto the Lord. Mothers make a difference when they decide to follow God, follow through with God, and keep on following God. Mothers, you'll make decisions when you constantly make them and be decisive for your children, for the Lord. Moms, dads, on this baby dedication Sunday, please understand, when you say you're dedicating your children unto the Lord, you have made a decision that the Lord will be first. And now you're going to determine your actions are going to be off of that and his promise and your promises unto him. You see, you make more decisions and more decisions based upon the rock of your salvation. The foundation of your salvation is the rock, the Lord, our God. Because it's pretty neat when you watch all these different things that happen in your life with your children when you make another decision and you're decisive and you stick with the Lord, even when people make fun of you, even when you get weak and tired, even when you fall back on some things, even when you fall, you say, hey, I got to get back to the Lord. We got to get back to the Lord because our family needs it. Our children needs it. I need it. And that's where we say, hey, Hannah was a difference maker. Today, what a great time to be able to have some baby dedications that we'll do in just a few minutes. I end with this thought for prayer today difference maker. This is the perfect day for our church 
to begin praying for these new parents. You say, I thought it was just the parents' responsibility to pray. <laughs> we have to keep on praying and continue to pray. Things may not go the way that you thought they were going to go. A lot of you have a lot more wisdom than me when it comes to being a parent. But I lean into the mothers today and I say, we'll pray for you and we're going to pray for you today for the next two or three minutes before we have baby dedication. And simply put, Father, work in the mothers of the children we dedicate today to be difference makers like Hannah. Hannah, oh Hannah, what an example. God has favored her, and God used her in a mighty way. What an example. And again, the first 10 verses of the second chapter tell you that woman never stopped praying. And of course, she prayed for her son. Before we do baby dedication, would you please stand? Go ahead, Debbie. Why don't you bow your heads? And let's have a time of prayer. You can come up forward and pray for a little bit, but there's music playing in the background. But I'm going to pray a little bit. Maybe you can pray right there. What a perfect day, perfect moment, a perfect time to say, moms, dads, we pray for you as you dedicate your child unto the Lord. Father in heaven, we come simply to you in this time of prayer, big time prayer. This is your church. We belong to you. You are the chief shepherd. You oversee us. We are in your stead. And Lord, you need to establish your word all the time in our lives, and you always do. Your promises are real. When we make vows, holy God, we get to a place where we say, okay, God, I'm going to be decisive, I'm going to be determined, I'm going to be dedicated unto you even when things are tough. I pray for our church, I pray for our, our young people, our parents that are going to come up here in a little bit, that God, oh my, make some difference makers and make some Hannahs and some Elkanahs and make some good parents here that truly God will wear out for you and wear in in this crazy time. God, we give this time to you for prayer in Jesus' name, amen.